there. You're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. It's a freezing cold evening in Dublin here and it's an ideal evening to make a Dark Vanishings video. Today's episode is the mysterious disappearance of Elaine Park. I'm also putting the finishing touches to a video on Elizabeth Barazza and one on Magdalena Zook. So do look out for those and thank you all for your suggestions. I really appreciate them. So let's get started. Elaine Park was a 20 year old woman from La Crescenta in California. She went missing on the 28th of January 2017. Her car, a 2015 Honda Civic, was found on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. All of her possessions were intact inside in the car, including cash, her phone and her laptop. The battery of the car was dead and the keys were still in the ignition. Elaine has never been seen since. So what did happen to Elaine on that fateful day? Well, I'd like to put forward a theory in this episode. So let's get into it. Elaine was one of two children. She also had a brother. Her parents were divorced when she was a young girl and she would take the divorce badly. Her mother would say that Elaine would then suffer bouts of depression that she hadn't suffered previously. On the plus side, Elaine was an extremely creative person. She loved singing, dancing, acting, designing clothes, uh, and she threw herself into creative pursuits at school and this appeared to give her a great deal of comfort during this more difficult emotional period. Here we see her on the left in her cheerleading outfit. She loved to cheerlead and on the right we can see her performing in school plays etc. After Elaine left school she studied at Pierce College. She also got a part-time job as a waitress. She continued to pursue her creative interests and secured small roles in huge productions like Crazy Stupid Love, Desperate Housewives and ER. Everything was headed in the right direction for Elaine. And then suddenly things would take a darker turn for reasons that I'll explain later in the video. She dropped out of her studies and she was laid off from her waitressing job. She decided to move back in with her mother and brother in the Glendale area of California. Her mother, however, would also be laid off from her job. So both women were under the same roof and money was extremely tight. They could often be heard arguing till late at night about very small amounts of money. The night before Elaine went missing, she was having a date night with on and off again boyfriend Div Compare. Div is the son of Shaquem Compare, co-owner of Flavor Unit Entertainment with Queen Latifah. Div lived with his parents in a gated community. Div had decided to ask Elaine to go to the cinema. He knew that she was having a difficult time with her mother and he thought that it would be good for her to kick back and chill a little. So they planned to go and see a movie and they booked an Uber to take them there. So here we see Div and Elaine heading out for their date night to the cinema. You can see the Uber uh, at the gate, the lights of the Uber there. Uh, a lot of people have remarked that Div and Elaine don't appear to be very close. He's sort of walking behind her. Um, perhaps it's just that the car was waiting and there isn't that much more to it than that. Having said all that, when you do see the video footage of Elaine and Div, Elaine is walking very briskly with her shoulders back. She almost looks like she's got beef with somebody or business that she wants to handle. That's sort of the impression that it gives. And I will talk a little bit about that later. Um, she's in front there and, and Div is behind. The Uber driver would say that Elaine and Div were in really good form. The CCTV footage then captures them returning from the cinema and going back into the property. They would then head to bed. Div would say that he woke up at 4am to find Elaine having a panic attack. She was restless, agitated, she was even singing. And at around 6am, she said to Div that she just had to go and she left the property. And we can actually see her leaving the property where the arrow is there on the still of the CCTV footage. She would then get into her car and the camera would capture the plate of her car leaving the gated community about eight or nine minutes later. CCTV footage from a garage would capture Elaine's car turning into the Carl Canyon area of the Pacific Coast Highway at 6.51 a.m. 
and at about 7.09 a.m. a woman matching Elaine's appearance or whose appearance is very close to Elaine's walks into the garage shop. She actually goes to the bathroom. Now she's sort of looking around and she's looking at her phone as you can see on the right there which would have been very typical of Elaine. She also goes up to the shop assistant at one point and then she goes outside and she sort of runs. Now I thought to myself perhaps this isn't Elaine at all and perhaps this is an early morning jogger and it's just pure coincidence. There is, however, a very striking resemblance. I took a still of Elaine from the date night uh, CCTV footage from the previous evening and you can see sort of the hair and the build is very similar. If you do look at the still on the left, however, it does appear as if she may have had bare legs in that particular still. Now, that's not to say that uh, perhaps she was wearing something to the knee. The footage is very grainy. It's hard to tell. Or perhaps when she woke up in the morning at Divs, she put on different clothing. It's possible that she maybe left some clothing there. There's certainly a very strong resemblance. Now, as I said, this woman is sort of restless. She's uh, running around outside of the garage. So I did think perhaps this is just a jogger uh, or it's Elaine looking to meet somebody. She's looking out for somebody because she does appear to be looking around. The only thing that I did think is that the behaviour is also consistent with the kind of behaviour that Div said Elaine was exhibiting back at his property. Uh, she was agitated, she had this desire to run away and perhaps this was just a continuation, the behaviour that we see in the garage shop of that panic attack. Now that's assuming that this is Elaine, we can't be 100% sure. There are one or two other women who appear in the footage uh, who do also look similar to Elaine but this lady here on the right certainly bore you know one of the closest resemblance and the timeline would match up with when Elaine's car turned into Coral Park Canyon. In the months leading up to Elaine's disappearance things hadn't been going well for Elaine. She was really having a run of bad luck. She dropped out of her studies, she had been laid off from her job and she'd also been in a car accident. Now she emerged from the car accident with minor injuries but her mother would encourage her to go to a chiropractor as she wished to inflate the claim. Elaine felt very uncomfortable about this because she felt that she was actually okay and she felt that this was tantamount to committing insurance fraud. But Elaine's mother persisted and on one occasion when Elaine dragged her heels and didn't want to go to the chiropractor, her mother would send her text saying, die, die, die. Now, as you can imagine, when the police found those texts, they were really concerned. Is it possible that Elaine's mother harmed Elaine and she would have had the added motivation of an insurance claim? Additionally, Elaine's mother would loan Elaine money and she would keep her on a very strict payback schedule. On the day that Elaine was last seen alive, Elaine's mother had loaned her $20 and she would text her incessantly looking for the $20 back. I personally feel that Elaine's mother didn't harm her daughter. She would go on to do some incredibly stupid things like, for example, she tried to let out her daughter's room a few months after Elaine disappeared. Now, this would make you look extremely guilty because if you're letting out your daughter's room, you appear to be very confident that she wouldn't return. I don't believe that somebody could be that stupid. I just think that she was genuinely struggling financially. Elaine's father had just made the last uh, maintenance payment on Elaine. She was now an adult and things were going to be tighter. She probably needed the cash. At one point, she also posted something to her calendar uh, to hide something in the garage on the day that the police were visiting with sniffer dogs. Now, the dogs did get the smell of blood, but it would turn out to be menstrual blood. Uh, it is rumoured that perhaps Elaine's mother was hiding drugs, maybe marijuana, in the garage. Uh, and this is what the note on her calendar met. She didn't want the police to find uh, the drugs. And again, I think if you were guilty of harming your daughter, I don't think you would post uh, to your calendar to hide something. I don't think that Elaine's mother was guilty. In fact, she was continuing to text Elaine after Elaine had actually disappeared, which suggests to me that she didn't know that um, 
you know, Elaine was even missing at this point. And we do also have to remember that the garage did pick up Elaine's car uh, turning onto Carl Canyon Road at 6.51 a.m. So it's clear that she left Divs and she went straight to the Pacific Coast Highway. And possibly Elaine was picked up uh, in the garage shop. Of course, we can't be as certain about that. But for me, I think that Elaine's mother uh, did not kill or harm Elaine. Was it possible that Elaine was the victim of foul play? There is a very interesting documentary on YouTube called The Dark Canyon. I highly recommend it and it actually covers disappearances in the Carl Canyon area. I personally don't feel that Elaine was the victim of a predator. There is also a possibility that perhaps she sort of staged a suicide. She left the keys in the ignition, made it look like she had walked out into the ocean and perhaps left and started a new life. But again, I don't think this is likely and I'm going to explain to you why uh, now. Anybody could have looked at Elaine Park, this beautiful, creative, talented woman, and thought that she had the perfect life. But as we know, she had also had her difficulties. She found her parents' divorce very traumatic as an example. And then in July 2015, a really dark event would befall Elaine. She would go to a hip hop gig at Orange County Observatory with her friends and afterwards they went backstage. Now Elaine had had some alcohol and some Xanax and she would become incredibly groggy and not be aware of her surroundings. When she came to, she had the distinct feeling that she had been raped and she would learn later that she had in fact been raped by several men Man and that they had videotaped it and that this video was still in circulation some two years later. So you can imagine the trauma of knowing that this, you know, horrible attack was, you know, circulating out there somewhere in the ether. What made, I think, things even more difficult for Elaine is that she didn't really have anybody she could talk to. She had a very fraught relationship with her mother. It would turn out that she had unfriended many of her school friends with whom she had been very close. Perhaps she felt they weren't very empathetic or hadn't stood by her. Um, and also, uh, you know, she had dropped out of college and, uh, you know, so who could she really turn to, you know? Uh, and then there was Div. Uh, Div obviously was somebody who was a huge support to Elaine, but it would turn out that he had some facts about the rape, although he was not involved in it. He knew the people that were. So perhaps in a way she felt that, you know, even though he was a good man and he was clearly very loving towards her, there was still that association with this awful experience that she had had. So in the end, we see Elaine on December 28th, 2016. This is over the Christmas period going on to Twitter and sharing about this experience. Now there's nothing wrong with somebody obviously sharing this type of information on Twitter. You know many people are the victims of rape and it can be comforting when people share about this but the impression I get is that this is the only form really that Elaine had to share this trauma on and that must have been an incredibly lonely place to be. Elaine would also post on social media that she didn't intend to take legal action against those that have perpetrated this crime against her. I think that that's really sad and I think it just reflects how isolated and powerless she felt because she would have been perfectly within her right to take legal proceedings. Eventually she would remove all of the tweets. Uh, so again we see that in the end the one forum that she felt she could turn to she didn't even find solace you know on the social media platform, uh, which isn't surprising. It's not the place to go when, when you're still raw like that. Um, and so she texts eventually Div to say that she wishes to break up. And here we see the real courage of Elaine. She tries to start again to build herself back up and to regain her confidence. And she says to Div, I love you enough to let you go and see you do good for yourself. I need this year to really invest in myself right now. So I'm going to grind and spend some time alone until I get myself real right. So again, here we see she's struggling. You know, she's trying to get herself back on track. 
We can both improve and do better, you know. I appreciate everything you've done for me. You really taught me a lot about myself and showed me my value when nobody else did. And again, you can see her confidence is at an all-time low. And also she's saying she didn't really have anybody to turn to. She says to Div, I'm never going to forget. Uh, you know, how you made me feel. And I wish you knew how I see you through my eyes. My heart has a real special place for you. And you can see that he's saying he doesn't want to lose her. He loves her. So I think there was a lot of genuine love between uh, Div and Elaine and that, you know, this was a very positive relationship. Just to mention as well that Div Compare was also a suspect in this case. Naturally, he was the last person to see her as far as everybody was aware that, you know, knew her really well. In fact, Elaine's mother would be highly suspicious of Div. I don't think that there's any evidence whatsoever that Div harmed Elaine. If anything, he seemed to be the one person that was incredibly loving and supportive of Elaine. One of the things that is really sad about Elaine's story is the amount of people that could potentially have had motive to harm her. And this suggests to me that her adult life was filled with abuse. I think she was sort of a nice person, maybe even a touch naive, and I think she could be exploited. So, for example, there was her mother who could have had motive because of the insurance claim. There were the men that raped her. Don't forget that she had just posted on Twitter that she wasn't going to take legal action. But for all they knew, she might post again a few weeks later and actually name people. So perhaps they had a motive. Elaine was also dating somebody briefly. And at one point they were pulled over by the police. And this guy actually had a gun. Now, a few days after Elaine disappeared, she was due to attend court because there was going to be a hearing about this man's possession of the gun. I personally feel that this actually was the key trigger in the end to Elaine's disappearance. I think that, you know, she knew this tape was out there somewhere, you know, of her being sexually assaulted. Perhaps she felt that the spotlight would be on her again because of this court case. Perhaps she was, you know, frightened, even though there was no evidence that this would happen, that it may be brought up in court or that somebody might share something on social media. And that it reignited the trauma again at a time when Elaine wanted to move on. So I personally feel that this uh, upcoming court case was pivotal in terms of Elaine's disappearance. And so now we get to my theory. And this is a, an academic article. It's Clinical Psychology Review. Um, and it's entitled Sexual Assault, Victimization and Psychopathology, a Review and a Meta-Analysis. It's basically, uh, you know, some very big words, but what it breaks down into, it looks at sexual assault victims and the effect on their mental health. And it's a review and a meta-analysis. That means that it looks at all the studies, you know, all the good studies, uh, and it comes up with, you know, a few key overall findings. And you can see where I have the arrow that it said that the stronger associations were observed for post-traumatic stress disorder and suicidality, you know, the urge to commit suicide. I personally feel that Elaine had undiagnosed and untreated post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of the rape that she endured. This is an extract from the Mayo Clinic page on post-traumatic stress disorder, and it discusses the causes at the top of the page there of post-traumatic stress disorder. It lists things like combat exposure, childhood physical abuse. Well, we do know that Elaine was the victim of abuse from her mother, mostly verbal, though occasionally physical. Uh, so that's one factor. And then it also lists uh, sexual violence, which we also know she was, you know, the victim of. Complications, it says halfway down, include, you know, effects on your job, relationships, health, enjoyment of everyday activities. Well, we know that, you know, Elaine dropped out of college. She unfriended her friends. Um, she was laid off from her job. Uh, and it also says you can experience depression and anxiety and also suicidal thoughts and actions. 
In this article in Psychiatry Research, it explores the association between nocturnal or nighttime panic attacks and suicide plans and attempts. And it basically says that the group that has uh, panic attacks in the study uh, at nighttime uh, were more likely to uh, make an attempt at suicide versus the group that would have a panic attack in the daytime. And I guess it makes sense because, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you're having a panic attack, there's nobody around, perhaps your support group isn't around you, your support network, perhaps things seem more intensified and uh, overwhelming at nighttime, um, you know, you're thinking less rationally, etc. And perhaps it is easier to become overwhelmed. And we do know that Elaine had a panic attack at 4 a.m., uh, you know, not quite the middle of the night, but not far off it. I think you can probably guess at this stage where I'm heading with my theory about Elaine. And by the way, there is a trigger warning for this particular piece. I do believe that there is a possibility that Elaine may have committed suicide. I think that she had undiagnosed and untreated post-traumatic stress disorder. She was extremely isolated. I think she was probably abandoned by quite a few of her friends along the way. And uh, I think that this just really sort of built up inside of her as is perfectly understandable. And we can see in this piece here that there you know, are cases of you know, suicide happening in these circumstances. We see reference here to Audrey Potter as an example who was 15 years old when she was raped by classmates at a friend's house. A photo of the assault was spread amongst her peers. A week later Potter committed suicide after posting on her Facebook wall quote the whole school knows my life is ruined now unquote now and I think that this is the kind of anguish that Elaine was dealing with for two years by herself and I think it is possible that it may have overwhelmed her. It's possible that she left the keys running in her ignition and she just maybe walked into the forest possibly, the canyon, just wandered around until she you know maybe died of you know uh, uh, malnutrition or she wandered out into the sea and her body was just never found. So Elaine began listening to the Pandora app that morning at around 7.13 a.m. She downloaded it on her phone. Now, if that was Elaine in the garage shop at 7.09 a.m., would she have had time to download the Pandora app? Now, she was only in the shop for a few minutes. Perhaps she downloaded the app as she walked back uh, to the car or she did it when she was in the bathroom. Or perhaps that wasn't Elaine at all. Regardless of whether that was Elaine in the garage shop or not, the garage CCTV footage did pick up her car at 6.51 a.m. Uh, turning into the Coral Canyon um, you know, the Pacific Coast Highway. So she was certainly in the vicinity. Now, downloading the app and listening to music, it does sound like something that, you know, she was doing as she, you know, sat in her car looking out at the ocean. She was obviously trying to calm herself. And I think it's really sad. We always see Elaine, you know, trying to find ways to sort of calm herself. You know, at one point she had tried to share on Twitter. Here she is, you know, sitting in isolation on this road, listening to music, looking out at the sea. I really do feel that Elaine had undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder order and that if she had got the necessary treatment uh, I think that Elaine would still be with us and also if she'd had you know a better support network that certainly would have you know helped to uh, you know prevent this awful situation from happening with Elaine. So I guess the moral of the story is if you are ever really isolated and you have no one to turn to and you have been through really traumatic experience, there is always a doctor, you know, that you can talk to. Uh, just make sure that you talk to somebody and that you reach out for professional help because, you know, they can also help. At 9.30 a.m., there was no activity on the Pandora app. In fact, it asked Elaine, was she still listening? 
Is it conceivable that at around 8.30, maybe 9 o'clock, she got out of her car, went into the ocean, possibly drowned herself and her body wasn't found? Or that she had, you know, run off, the panic attack was still continuing into the forest, perhaps got lost, her body was never found. I do think there was a sort of self-harm, suicide element to Elaine's story. I think if there had been a predator, this was a busy road, somebody would probably have seen something. And if she was meaning someone, to start a new life and she left the keys and the ignition to sort of fake a suicide there probably would have been texts showing you know who she was meeting so I think that the suicide self-harm theory is definitely a front runner in terms of theories. I think the div could have been indirectly linked to Elaine's disappearance. Although he wasn't involved in her assault, it's clear that he had information about the assault, that he knew these people. And in some of the text exchanges between him and Elaine, he mentions that he needs to let all of this out to her. So is it conceivable that that night that they went to the cinema, when they got back to the house, he did share some details. She had a kind of look about her, as I said, in the CCTV footage, as if she was trying to, you know, get to grips with some issue. You know, she she meant business, you know, that that's sort of a look about her. And it's possible that he might have shared whatever facts he knew, which in itself reignited this panic attack and, uh, you know, just overwhelmed her. And with this court case coming up in her mind, she felt that, you know, in some way her privacy was going to be exposed. Um, you know, she was going to be subjected to this, you know, awful ordeal. Um, you know, in the way that Audrey Potts was, and it was just too much. Elaine's case is still an open and active case. You can see an email address there and also a helpline if you do have any tips or information. I wish Elaine's family the very best with their onward search. Elaine's mother did at one point think that Elaine perhaps had committed suicide, but until a body is found, there is always hope. We do hear of stories of people who disappear when life gets tough and they reappear several decades later. So there is always hope and I wish Elaine's family the best of luck with their search. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, please do like, comment or subscribe. Every new subscriber, every comment, every like really means the world to me. I really appreciate your support and I'll see you in the next video. Take care and all the best.